Good afternoon boys and girls and welcome to another Sunday School. Let's pray. Lord God our Heavenly Father we thank you for Sunday School and for your word and we thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ who spoke in parables. Lord we pray that our hearts would understand the meaning of the parable today in Jesus name. Amen. Well I've come to the very same apple tree that Ben came to last week to teach us about a parable of the Lord Jesus, the parable of the man who was very prosperous and had lots of fruits and he built big barns to put his fruits in but that very night his soul was required of him and he'd never given any thought to his soul and he wasn't ready to die and he was a fool Jesus said well this week we've got another parable and we pray that God helps you to understand what these parables mean they're earthly pictures and stories with a heavenly meaning. Well get your Bibles ready and read along with the Devogels who are going to be reading our Bible passage. So today's readings are on the narrow and broad way and we have three different portions of scripture to read today. So get your Bibles and we'll turn to Matthew chapter 7 and we will read Matthew chapter 7 verses 13 and 14. So get your Bibles ready and starting at verse 13 enter ye in at the straight gate for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction and many there be which go in thereat because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life and few there be that find it and so the next portion of the bible that we'll read if we go to luke chapter 13 and we go and read verses 22 to 24. So Luke chapter 13, verses 22 and 24. And the reason we're reading three passages is because they all talk about the same subject. So verses 22, and he went through the cities and villages, teaching and journeying toward Jerusalem. Then said one unto him, Lord, are there few that be saved? And he said unto them, Strive to enter in at the straight gate, for many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in and shall not be able. And then going on in the Gospels to John chapter 10, and we'll read verses 1 to 9. John chapter 10, 1 to 9. So we've done Matthew, we've done Luke, and now we're going to John. The first four books of the New Testament are Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. They're called the Gospels and we've read in Matthew, we've read in Luke and now we'll read the Gospel of John chapter 10 verses 1 to 9. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own sheep by name, and leadeth them out. And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. And a stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. This parable spake Jesus unto them, but they understood not what things they were which he spake unto them. Then said Jesus unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved, and shall go in and out and find pasture. Well, thank, thank you to the Devogels for that Bible reading. Now, I don't know if Ben noticed, but around this apple tree, there are lots of little, you see that there? Lots of little frogs. And not long ago, these were tadpoles, weren't they? Remember? This one is fully formed as a frog. I can't see a tail at the back. Can you? So it's fully a frog, I think. Now, this is part of God's amazing creation, how tadpoles turn into frogs. Do you remember what the process is called, beginning with M? From tadpoles going to frogs. Well, we're going to have a little video, maybe this week or next week, at the pond again. Uh, because some of the tadpoles haven't quite become fully frogs, they've still got a little bit of a tail left and we're going to learn about that process beginning with M and it doesn't just happen to frogs, it happens in butterflies as well so 
Thank you again to the Devogels for our Bible reading. We're going to go now to David Stanley, who's got a Bible lesson for us, and it's from the parable that we read. Hello, boys and girls. It's David here. You've probably been wondering where I've been, but the good news is I'm back. Today we're learning about another parable Jesus told. Can you remember what a parable is? Yes, that's right. A parable is a story that Jesus told. But no ordinary story. This story has lessons to teach us about things we should change in our lives. Today's story, today's parable, is very, very short. It's one of the shortest parables, in fact. It's only two verses. It's called the parable of the broad and narrow way. The Lord Jesus was speaking to many people when he told this parable. Let's read this parable again from Matthew chapter 7 verse 13. Listen really carefully and we'll hear the words that Jesus spoke. Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go thereat, because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Did you hear that? Jesus said that life is being like on two ways, or two roads, or two paths. One road is really, really wide. The other road is really narrow and small. Each road has a gate on it. The gate to the broad road is really, really wide. But the gate to the narrow road is really, really small. The wide road with the broad gate leads to destruction. And the narrow road with the narrow gate leads to life. This life, for those who are on the narrow road, is not our life now. It's another life. It's a life after death in heaven. It's so wonderful. A far better and per perfect life with God in heaven. However, I have some sad news to tell. If the narrow way leads to life, which is life after death in heaven, then what is the destruction at the end of the broad road? Sadly, very sadly, it is everlasting punishment, pain and hurt in hell. I don't want to tell you this, sad, but I must, because those who are on the broad road end up in hell. But Jesus taught this parable out of kindness and love so that we don't go there. He warns us so we don't end up in hell. You see, many people don't realise where they will go when they die. Each one of us can easily avoid going to hell by turning from our sin to the Lord Jesus Christ in prayer and asking him to forgive us our sins. When Jesus was on the earth, there were no cars, no lorries. In fact, the first cars were only invented around 130 years ago. But Jesus lived 2,000 years ago. But there were big, wide, broad roads when Jesus was alive on the earth. There were big roads, like motorways, not for cars and lorries, but for chariots. What's a chariot, you may ask? They are, um, a chariot is a vehicle pulled by a horse, and you could get from somewhere to another place very fast, far quicker than walking. These chariots went along big wide Roman roads and the Romans built big wide roads for the chariots and their horses. You may have been on a motorway or a fast road. Here is a picture of a fast road. Can you see how wide this road is? With two white lanes so that lots of cars can travel down. The reason they are all very broad is the broad wide road allows lots and lots of cars to drive very very fast. On the fastest roads in England you can drive even up to 70 miles an hour. You know the broad road can seem safe, but you can be tricked by the broad road. There's plenty of space on the broad road with um, space each side to react to the dangers along the road. You have space to adjust your driving to the bends in the road, the cars and the lorries on the side and all those dangers. However, if there's a danger in front of you, a hidden danger, like a pothole or even a bigger hole in the road, you might not be able to see it. You could crash and hurt yourselves or even die. That's like being on the broad road Jesus spoke about. The wide road seems very exciting and very safe, but the devil has tricked us so we can't see the danger ahead. The devil is like a great big lorry in front of us, blocking our view so we can't see God's warnings and God's signs about the way of salvation. We're going so fast, being so busy in our lives, that suddenly, without realising, death is approaching. Without warning, we could die and drop into hell itself. 
The devil tricks us by saying there's no punishment after death, so that we don't need Jesus to save us from any punishment. So many people die or are unaware of where they're going because of the devil's tricks. When you're older, you'll probably learn to drive a car, and that will be really exciting. You will learn that you have to go very slowly on the narrow roads. If you drove very quickly on the narrow roads, then you wouldn't have the distance and the time to react. Perhaps there are lots of parked cars on narrow roads around with your house where you have to where your parents have to drive very slowly. And that's true in the parable Jesus told about our lives. The narrow way is small, so that when we go on this narrow way we have to slow down and even stop at the gate. But what do I mean when I say we have to go slowly in our lives? Well, we need to be serious. We need to realise that if we really want to go to heaven, we are going far too fast along the broad road and God is watching us from heaven. It's like God is watching us like a speed camera and constantly counting our sins. That would help us to stop and think about the way to the narrow way, how we need to be forgiven. But there's one final lesson we can learn from this parable. Did you know God's word is like a signpost? If you go on a walk all around your house, along the streets and along every all the roads around where you live, I'm sure you'll see signposts. The Lord Jesus' word, the Bible, is like many, many signs on the broad road, like exit signs on the broad road, telling us how can we get off the broad road that leads to help, to go on the narrow road that leads to forgiveness of sins. Every day we live on our lives, we, as it were, pass a sign. And we go past the sign, a warning of God. And perhaps maybe you think when you're, a, you'll become a Christian when you're older. And perhaps when you're older, you'll start to read the Bible. But maybe when you're older, you might not be able to see to read the Bible. Or maybe you might have lost your Bible. Maybe you might not want to read the Bible. It's like the signs become less and less clear. Every day God signs in creation and his words saying, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. But eventually you might not see the signs, you might not see the narrow way, because it's so small and difficult to see. Like a gap, a small street, you might not even, you might just miss it. And when you might, as you get older, forget that you must be forgiven and struggle to understand these things. Well, what causes us to Forget and miss and not see the narrow way. Well, it's something called, something terrible, called our sin. That sin deserves eternal punishment in hell. It's why we're on the broad way in the first place. Because we all start off on the broad way. You know, the Lord Jesus Christ is so kind. He has given us so many signs in his word to tell us how to get on that narrow way that leads to heaven. Let's now pray and ask God to take away our sins and forgive us and bring us on the narrow way. Lord God, our loving Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for this amazing parable that speaks that we are on the broad road. But, O oh Lord, we thank Thee that Thou didst send the Lord Jesus Christ to point us to the narrow way, that we might be on the path to heaven. We give thanks that he came to forgive us our sins if we trust in him because he died on the cross for us. We pray this through Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you so much for listening and I really look forward to seeing you for another session online at Sunday School. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, David, for that parable and that lesson on the narrow way and the broad way, or the narrow gate and the broad gate. Well, does this give you a clue to one of the sayings that Jesus said? He said, I am the light of the world. And he said, I am the true vine, didn't he? Well, this week, we're going to do our memory verse as an I am saying. So over to Grace for the memory verse. Hello, boys and girls. I'm sorry I can't invite you in because we've got some local restrictions here in Tenbrough because of the coronavirus. But maybe we can use the door to help us learn our memory verse this week. 
It's one of Jesus' I am sayings, and it can be found in John chapter 10, verse 9. Jesus says, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved, and shall go in and out and find pasture. Now, let's make sure we understand what this means before we try and learn it. It starts off with Jesus saying, I am. I am is one of the names that God uses for himself in the Old Testament, so that reminds us that Jesus is God. The door. Now, what do you do with the door? You walk through it, don't you? By me, if any man shall enter in, he shall be saved. So Jesus is saying here that we will be saved if we go through the Lord Jesus Christ, that we can go to heaven if we go through the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, there's another thing I want you to notice, boys and girls, here. It says, if any man. Now, that really means if any man or any woman. That's good news because any of us, whether we're big or small, whether we've done good things or whether we've done bad things, whether we're from Old Hill or whether we're from Africa, it doesn't matter. The Lord Jesus says that if you enter by him, you shall be saved. I'm very sad that I can't invite you in this week to my house. But God will invite you to heaven if you go through the Lord Jesus. And he doesn't just invite you into his house. He invites you into his family and he will adopt you and you become, can become one of his sons and daughters. Now let's say it together. Three. I am the door. By me, if any man shall enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. Thank you for listening, boys and girls. Now we're going to go over to Dr. Henry de Vogel for a difficult definition. Hello, children, and welcome to today's difficult definition. And today's word that we're going to look at is the word sin, which is actually the smallest definition we've done today because it's only three letters, isn't it? S I N. But it is one of the most important words to understand because the Bible and Christians talk about sin a lot. The Bible says things like we have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. It says be sure your sin will find you out. And it even says Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. So the Bible talks about sin a lot and we need to understand what is sin. And that's a good question. What is sin? Why are we sinners? And what does it mean? So imagine you are in Bible times and you are walking around the town and you wouldn't see children playing with Nerf bullets and Nerf guns. No, you would see the men practicing archery, which is where you have a bow and arrow and you would have a target and you would aim at the target and try and get the very centre of the target and the, the man or whoever it is who could be the furthest away from the target but still aim at the centre and get the centre would be a person who was well praised, a person who would be lifted up by the others. But if you miss the mark, it would have been shameful. And that's what sin means. It means missing the mark. Now I've got a small toy bow and arrow. I'm going to see if I can try and get the target, okay? Three, two, one. Oh, I've missed the mark. Maybe one more time, one more time. Let's see if I get the, get the mark this time round. I'll get a little bit closer this time. Oh, I've still missed. And that is what sin means, missing the mark. Now, we have the Bible, don't we? And it tells us about the Ten Commandments. It gives us ten rules that God has given us and he has actually given us much more rules in the Bible as well. We have all broken one, at least one of those rules uh, uh, that God has set for us. And we have done wrong things, haven't we? We can even see the effects when we do wrong things to our brothers or sisters or mother or, or dad. We have done those things which are wrong and it upsets other people. But we also have broken God's commandments and God must punish those things that we have done wrong. You see, God's law is the centre of the target and we've missed the mark. We have done those wrong things. And it's important that we understand that we are guilty of missing the mark in the sight of God. But, children, there is a way of escape. The Lord Jesus Christ has come down and he's lived that perfect life. He has always hit the bullseye. He has always hit the centre of the target. And he went to the cross at Calvary and laid down his life for those that trust in him. And if we trust in him, 
his whole life of hitting the mark will become ours. So that all the times we have missed the mark get completely forgiven. They are completely forgotten by God. So I pray that you would trust in the Lord Jesus Christ as well. It is so important to have forgiveness of our sins. So there is the word sin defined. It's a three letter word, S-I-N, and it is so important to understand. Thank you, children. Now we've got a gate at the back of our garden and sometimes I find it a bit narrow as well. Let's go over here uh, to where I've got the wheelbarrow. You see the wheelbarrow? Now sometimes I try and pack the wheelbarrow too full and I try and go over here and get it through the gate. Now, that's a bit like us trying to get through the gate and it's too narrow. Maybe the gate to heaven that Jesus was speaking of. And you know, sometimes there are things that we have to put aside until we can come through this door, this narrow door. And one of those things we can't go through is with our good works. You know, some people think they're so good that they can go to heaven and go through the door by themselves. But Jesus said it's a narrow gate and one of the things we have to get rid of is realise that we're not good. All our good works are really as filthy rags and we need to get rid of them and say Lord I'm a sinner and come as you are and confess your sins and go through the door, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ only for your salvation. And then it's much simpler you see because then you simply just walk through the door, humbly trusting in the Lord Jesus and not yourself. Now boys and girls, does anyone remember that big word beginning with M? And it's what happens when tadpoles turn into frogs. What do we call that? We call it metamorphosis, do you remember? Now we're going to go to the pond in a minute and see that most of the tadpoles now have become frogs and metamorphosis has happened. Now there are other creatures that have metamorphosis and I'm going to show you after the tadpoles two other creatures I found in this garden that metamorphosis happens and see if you know what they are. If you look in this water now, in the open water, there are no signs of many tadpoles left. But if we go over to where the reeds are to the side of the pond maybe we'll see metamorphosis has been completed. Well, here's one that's fully developed. Here he is. Not much of a tail, if anything, left on this one. Can't see a tail there, can we? Now, can we try and find a frog, I wonder, that's still got a little bit of its tail left? I think there's one here that just climbed up out of the surface of the water onto the muddy bank. Can you see at the back there's still a tiny little tail, only about half a centimetre. Look what I found between these two slabs. 
Anyone know what it is? Well, clue number one, these are also amphibians and they start off as creatures in the water that look very much like tadpoles and then they turn into this creature. It begins with an N and ends with a T. Anyone know what it is? Back to the pond for our third creature. Well, can you tell what this flying insect is? This one's a female and she's laying eggs. She can lay up to hundreds of eggs in a single day. This was in May in the springtime. Now these eggs will hatch and the creatures that hatch will live in the water for a few months, even up to two years. Metamorphosis will happen and they will change into a creature just like her. Can you tell what this flying insect is yet? Well, there's three creatures where metamorphosis happens. And the third one was, do you know what the third insect was? It was a flying insect, the dragonfly. And dragonflies are amazing. I've got a book here and it's got lots of God's amazing uh, creatures in it and here's the dragonfly this is a close-up picture of the dragonfly's eye and the many lenses and the great eyesight of the dragonfly now this book was uh, written or he helped write it Andy McIntosh professor Andy McIntosh and I wonder if we could maybe get hold of him and he could do us a video and I will ask him to talk to us a bit more about this amazing creation of metamorphosis and he's a Christian you know he follows the Lord Jesus maybe he'll have a lesson as well for our souls so let's see if I can get hold of Professor Andy McIntosh well hello boys and girls I'm just going to explain to you a little bit about metamorphosis which uh, Stephen Stonelake has been talking with you about and I'm going to share with you about how this happens with some creatures which I'm sure you already know about and that is butterflies who have an extraordinary beginning as uh, eggs which then become caterpillars and they gorge themselves become bigger and bigger and then eventually they go into a chrysalis and of course it's not that way up it's the other way up that they hang from a branch and out comes a moth or else it might be a butterfly and then we see these beautiful butterflies which are very different creatures to the caterpillars that they came from because not only do they fly but they they feed differently on nectar whereas before the caterpillar with its jaws was eating leaves and all sorts of other things so these are big changes and yet you need the second creature which is the butterfly to lay the eggs for the first creature which is a caterpillar so that is a big problem for people who believe in evolution to explain so you've got this butterfly life cycle where the caterpillar goes into a chrysalis then it becomes a butterfly which then lays the egg for the caterpillar so you can't say that uh, something like a worm changed into a caterpillar because suddenly the new creature uh, cannot lay eggs for itself. It relies on the second creature, which it's going to change into later, to, in order to get into the next generation of caterpillars. And anyway, butterflies are exactly the same in the past, in the fossil record, as they are today. In the little program that was wonderfully produced by Stephen, you saw a dragonfly, and I'm showing you here, a metahawk dragonfly. And you actually saw some damselflies in the video 
which are not too dissimilar. They're very similar in the way that they work because their eggs don't start off in air. Their eggs start off in water. This is the scarlet marshal dragonfly that I took some years ago when I was in India. And it's got a beautiful red backside coming out, which makes it very easy to see. Anyway, when the nymph, which uh, Stephen talked to you about, has been underwater sometimes for as long as two years, it crawls out and it then molts and out comes not another larger version of the nymph, but now as you can see, the big creature on the left is the newly formed dragonfly, which has come out of the casing, which is the molt, the, the last molt, which we call an exuvia. And whether it be a damselfly, like this common blue damselfly, or whether it be a dragonfly, it's now going to be a very different creature because it not only flies, whereas before the creature before was just swimming, but it's also breathing differently. These common blue damselflies are actually going to be breathing by little holes in their bodies, which are called spiracles. And you can see as this dragonfly is coming out of its last molt it's got threads which are pulling away from the spiracle holes in order to enable it to breathe now it does breathe through its mouth as well but this is a totally different way of breathing to what the nymph was doing the nymph was using gills to breathe like a fish. So you've got massive changes here, and I want you to see that this is a big evidence for creation. People who believe in evolution cannot explain what to us is obvious that God has made these creatures, and they are then able to understand that God has put in nature something which is a picture actually of becoming a christian because it says in 2 corinthians chapter 5 verse 17 that if any man be in christ he is a new creature old things are passed away behold all things are become new that's 2 corinthians chapter 5 verse 17 and an evolutionist doesn't understand why things are the way they are. Whereas a Christian, he looks at the science and he does understand because God has put things in nature for us to understand and they point to the great truth of the Bible. May God speak to each one of you. Thank you for listening to me. My name is Professor Andy McIntosh, and as Stephen mentioned, I wrote that book with Stuart Burgess, Wonders of Creation. God bless you. Well, I've just watched the video that Andy sent, and I want to say thank you to him very much. That was a wonderful video with some amazing pictures in it, and it's late at night now here. You can see some of these large frogs. Maybe these are the parents of the original tadpoles another one over here can you see so thanks again andy for that reminder of god's wonderful creation and particularly what you said about how we become new creatures when we become christians like that beautiful butterfly and we become beautiful new creatures in god's sight through Christ. So if you think it's because you're a good person that you're going to heaven, you need to leave that behind and trust in Jesus only. And maybe you could ask God 
to show you what else you need to leave behind from your heart and in your life what you need to leave behind so that you can enter into the narrow gate believe the Lord Jesus and have eternal life ask God to show you what you need to leave behind and trust in him well let's pray and see you all next week God willing Lord we thank you for the Lord Jesus and his words we pray that boys and girls men and women would enter in through the Lord Jesus Christ believe on him and know eternal life we ask this in Jesus name Amen <laughs>